Okay, and also our uh, meeting now is already streaming live in YouTube. So those who cannot uh, join the, our Zoom, you can uh, join the YouTube uh, channel. And uh, I want to say hello from the someone from Laguna, Antipolo, Qatar, and Banten, Malang, Indonesia. Oh. I hear from the administrator that we have a one thousand, almost one thousand register. Okay, before we start the our online webinar first of the keynote address is addressing by the dr may tiana indrasari dr may tiana indrasari will be speak about the education experience in crisis dr may tiana indrasari is a vice rector of the dr stoma university chairwoman of the p2bpt and Chairwoman of the Adri East Java, and also president of the ICASB chapter Surabaya, and the editor and reviewer, and uh, many reputable journal. Sorry, the admin, please. Please uh, welcome the Dr. Mitiana Indrasari. Times is yours. Would you please the for I start to share my uh, material? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Daniel, for the time. The Honorable, uh, all lecture from Dr. Sutomo University, maybe one of the participants, uh, there is Vice Rector of Dr. Sutomo University, Dr. Yanto, and my best senior, Prof. Louis, the Dean of Business Administration at the University of East Kaloocan, Philippines. And also my best friend, Dr. Mujtaba Momin, Assistant Professor, Human Resource Management from University of Middle East Kuwait in affiliation with Purdue University, Indiana, USA. And also for all international webinar participants, Alhamdulillah, we can gather and meet you online on the topic of online distance learning during COVID-19. I wish you and your family be protected and blessed by Allah in Ramadan Karim. Amen. Okay. Uh, you can next because the moderator already, yeah. Okay. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, Indonesian people have been stayed at home for more than a month. Almost all of our campus activities are online. And today, I just want to share about what I've seen and heard during the pandemic COVID-19. And I choose the topic of education experience in crisis and talking about new normal and old normal in education. Honestly, for the campus activities, Actually, there is a positive impact from the pandemic. We often say that extraordinary technology advanced made the world without border and space anymore. What we can get with the gadgets in our hand, we can do anything with our gadget. 
and Indonesia education has already created for online learning for several years ago to reach world university ranking and cyber campus. Okay, we will talk about the regulation. Undang-undang, Constitution, Constitution, number 12, 2012, concerned in higher education and Ministry of Education, and also culture regulation number 109, 2013. Distance education is a teaching and learning process that is done remotely through the use of various communication media. In this area, information and communication technology. It seems clear that education is something that should not affect during the COVID-19. Okay, let's talk about education in Tridharma as new normal. We have university performance in Indonesia. We call Tridharma Perguruan Tinggi. There are three content. The first one is teaching and learning, and the second research, and the third service community. We will talk the first one, teaching and learning. One of university performance. There are so many options of teaching and learning, but most of we do the conventional one. And I think we can deliver all theory of knowledge by online, except if it contact with human lives, such as medicine. And the second one is research. A lot of research that has been used online. We are quite familiar with this. In searching for a basic or empirical theory, we can use online scientific journal. Even in Indonesia, published journals are required to be online and open access, and also collaboration with various countries according to their field of science to become reviewer. Our speaker, Prof. Louis and Dr. Mujtaba, they are our reviewer from our journal. And the third one is service community. In our regulation, what we call for our activities today, especially me, it is community service. This is one of the example that there is no problem with online. For the output of community service is also the same with research, scientific publication. And now for publication, we will 100% publication, publication process is online. Why I say this? Because I am as editor-in-chief an accredited and international index, one of scientific journal in our campus. So I can say this, I can say that there is no manual step in publication process. Okay. University one touch. New normal, which is currently in college, is actually old please. normal. Actually, it is old normal. We have online program for several years, but it seems to be difficult to implement it. And finally, carry it out totally when a pandemic. Okay. Next we will please. start from registration. Yeah. Sorry, the operator. Next, please. Next. University. Yeah. One touch. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We will start from registration. Indonesia campus are already online for this. Starting from data filling to online payments with connected banking service. And then classes. We have practiced almost all classes with online method in the pandemic. Only the beginning was confused by the server. But in my campus, online class is only for professional scheme. When pandemic, it is required for all students. When 8,000 students entered online, the server was oversized and down. 
but we adapt for this. And the new fact, this is the new fact, interesting and unique new fact, I think. Because especially in my class, students are more active and brave in discussion. And, it, and also it will be, uh, uh, it will be uh, good in discussion. So they got new skill from discuss and also from technology. And the third, we threw exams. We just finished mid test in my campus especially with full online and thanks God, everything went smoothly. And then continue to thesis from seminar to the final presentation test we can do online without any significant obstacles. So we can conclude that in this pandemic, it should not be harmful to student academic activities. And we get the bonus from this, the output they have with skills of technology that is qualified enough to go into the community. Next. What we can conclude, trim the bureaucratic. As stated by Emil de Giardin, bureaucratic is the depotism of inaction. And also Otto van Bismarck state that bureaucratic is where we fall and get sick. I have three tips for crisis survival. They are start of uh, the letter, the letter uh, of my name. Number one is M, number two is E, number three is I, M, E, I, May. The first one, manage your cash flow better. In crisis, cash is a king. We have to downsize in order to survive. Spend money only for basic needs. Basic and the second, E, explore your opportunity. Working from home, study from home has more efficient time so that we also have enough time to upgrade skills by reading book, attending online training like this, and things that can improve the quality of ourselves and our families. And the last one, I, innovate to survive ecosystem we must work in hand to help and strengthen our environment. That's all for my presentation. Thank you for the attention. Good afternoon. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, thank you, Dr. Me, for the nice presentation about the crisis. But I have a note about your from your name, M E I. MEI, uh, yeah. MEI. M Minist is a uh, minister cast, okay. <laughs> and uh, E F is uh, e explore. Explore. Yeah. And, uh, innovate. Uh, innovate to okay. survive the community. Oh, okay. This is uh, May. So if you remember, this is the May, the month of May. <laughs> if you remember the Dr. May, our uh, speakers. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we will go to the our second uh, speakers, the Dr. Muchaba uh, Morning. The Dr. Muchaba Morning is a uh, associate uh, professor in the American University of Middle East, uh, Kuwait. And uh, please admin highlight the Dr. Muchaba. Hello, Dr. Muchaba. Hello everyone. How are you all doing? Uh, yeah, fine. I, uh, even they are now as a COVID, yeah. But uh, I think it's uh, still morning, yeah, in uh, Kuwait now. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, the situation here is pretty much like it is in the rest of the world. Uh, the number of cases are increasing for now, but inshallah, we are hoping that after we hit the peak, it will start declining. And we are hoping that in the coming few weeks, we should be able to relax a few of the restrictions like we are seeing in Europe and we are seeing in some other parts of the world. Yeah, hopefully, yeah. 
And uh, I want to introduce the Dr. Muchaba Momin. Uh, he is a PhD in the management science. Uh, he's very passionate in the learning teaching, uh, teaching about the GCC region since uh, 2010 and uh, author the sum of the book. Okay, Dr. Uh, Momin, uh, time is yours. Thank you so much, Daniel. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, and thank you very much, May, for this opportunity. In today's session, I'm going to try to share with you uh, my views about how education is impacted in this COVID-19 situation. I would tell you briefly about uh, how the world is responding, including how is the response in uh, this part of the world. So let's begin with what I have to share with you. Uh, do we have the presentation put up? Eko, do we have the presentation? Thank you so much. So this is going to be the focus of my talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about how distance education is uh, coming to the rescue, as I would like to call it. Conventional education is uh, a luxury now, you know, in a situation where countries are locking down, when countries are impacted so severely because of the COVID-19 situation, we cannot go to the classrooms and educate like we used to do before. In many universities and in many institutions like uh, May's University, we can see that they were already futuristic. They were planning for it. And some part of their teaching was happening online. But that's not true about all the universities. We can see that there are many disparities, many inequalities in the world. You can see that there are some universities which have absolutely no IT infrastructure. They really do not have uh, the means. Uh, but that luxury has now become a necessity. So let me take you through what I have uh, to discuss with you. Eko, can we go to the next slide, please? The next slide, please. This is a bit about me. I guess Daniel has told you about myself already. So can we go to the next slide? OK, these are the topics that I wish to discuss with you very briefly, because I don't want it to be a very technical session full of crammed off a lot of information. I want to discuss with you about the pandemic and its impact uh, on education worldwide. This is something that is not uh, unknown to any of us now. We can all see that the COVID-19 situation has almost impacted all the countries in the world. And education is no exception. Education field also has been very severely impacted. The other thing that I want to discuss with you today is why is it particularly relevant to educational institutions? I mean, why do we need to see it from the context of educational institutions? I also want to discuss with you what is the risk of ignoring to respond proactively. Imagine if we fail to respond to this situation proactively and we respond reactively, there are some risks which I would like to briefly discuss with you. Then I'm going to talk about the accelerated transformation of the role played by educators. You know, the role that educators have played that is transitioning significantly. And because of the, you know, stepping in of technology now, educators are expected to have a very wider role. And finally, I'll discuss with you how we can harness, how we can exploit technology for our advantage, how it can enable us, you know, to continue our mission of education. The next slide, please. Next. Okay. Um, if you look at the UNESCO resources, UNESCO has conducted extensive surveys. UNESCO has come up with a lot of guidelines to 
guide how educators, how the education, educational establishments in different countries okay. must respond to this situation. So UNESCO has come up with a comprehensive survey in which it is advising different countries about how they should respond to the existing situation. It's a completely new situation. We cannot play a new game with the old rules. The rules will also have to evolve. The rules will have to keep pace with the time. UNESCO has, has also identified a number of challenges. It's very easy for us to guess what I'm some of those challenges are. Uh, sorry. You know. Sorry, can you... Am I clear? Am I, am I audible? Yeah, sorry. sorry, everyone, please um, unmute your Operator, you, you can mute all the participants and then on the speaker. That's speakers. all. Okay, thank you. Can I continue? All right. So uh, UNESCO has also come up with a lot of recommendations. But I'm going to talk about the key challenge that educational institutions are facing uh, as we move forward. Next, please. OK, this is a graph that will show the impact of uh, COVID-19 on education. This is actually something which was retrieved a lot earlier. This is These figures are from sometime in the end of March. So from that time until now, the situation has not improved. You know, it has only gotten worse. We can see that there are nearly uh, 1.3 billion people, billion with a B, billion people who are impacted, learners, educators, people who depend on education, people who are, you know, consuming education, they are at different levels of education. All of them, a huge number of them have been impacted very severely. This figure simply shows how profound the impact of COVID-19 has been. Friends, we all know the population of Earth is nearly 7 billion, isn't it? So out of 7 billion people, we can see that almost 1.5 billion people are who are taking education are severely impacted because of COVID-19 situation. Next. Okay, this is another map. You know, it is showing... Uh, the places it is highlighting, emphasizing on the places in which students are having to stay at home. You know, they cannot continue their education. Friends, it's very easy to understand why we are talking specifically in terms of education. Educational institutions are places where a lot of people come together and they are sitting in close proximity and that is where they are taking education. So obviously a place which is it's not crowded, but it's a place which has a lot of people within it would be definitely a fertile place for virus to multiply. So here you can see that there are stay at home orders issued by, you know, the number of governments and that has severely impacted the delivery of education. It's not just about, you know, people who are studying in the lower classes or higher classes, this has an impact on just about everybody. Next. Okay, so this is what I was telling you. Why is it particularly relevant? Why are we talking particularly about the educational institutions? Because educational institutions are in a way particularly vulnerable. You see, these are places where um, if you do not regulate it, if good hygiene is not maintained, the COVID-19 situation can get seriously worse because of, you know, crowding. Imagine, we all know, I mean, you know, there's so much information about COVID-19 available online today. I'm sure we all know that younger people are less likely to be affected because of COVID-19. They might get the virus and they would heal by themselves younger people are likely to have a better immune system and their immune system will protect them. But nevertheless, however, 
young people may still be carriers you know when they go home they meet their grandparents even their parents so that is a serious risk so it's very important that we understand the education specific impact uh, of this pandemic as i was referring to the unesco's word of advice a lot of times i notice because i i try to make good use of the unesco and un resources i can leave a link here and i want you to see the different resources that they have put together the advisories the data a lot of information has been simplified and made available which also includes unesco's advice and this advice does not come from any whatsapp forward it's not you know from just about anyone you know, the keypad happy people just forwarding things no when we are talking about advice from unesco it comes from the experts and i would really encourage you all i want you all to have a look at the unesco resources i would like to share with you perhaps in the chat i will share with you a link which i would like you to access and see the resources that unesco has put together now a super important topic forget about the data forget about um, the numbers let's talk about something which really matters to everybody at large it's the impact of uh, covid-19 on inequality you know inequality simply means the inequality we do not have equal opportunities maybe some kids in sub saharan africa you know kids maybe in yemen kids in poorer countries maybe they do not have access to resources which will enable them to access uh, you know distance learning it they may not have the forget about the tablets or mobile phones forget about these uh, accessories and gadgets they might not even have simple electricity and this will only increase inequality you know the inequality the gap between the haves and the have nots will only multiply you know the people who are struggling the people who are in the lower end of the pyramid why are they there really why what is the reason what is a significant reason for poverty it is lack of education and in a situation which uh, cuts off the access of poor people to education the problem only gets worse maybe it will not impact kids in rich neighborhoods maybe it will not impact uh students who have all the resources they have wifi they've got ipads they've got high end devices but think about those who do not have access to these facilities these are luxuries for them a lot of things maybe the richer kids would take it for granted you know they would say okay it's all right i have it i have it but these things which a lot of rich people would take for granted maybe these are luxuries and this may not be available to a huge number of you know uh, underprivileged students or learners now what happens because of this why are the poor poor the poor are largely poor because they don't have access to education and a situation like this decreases their access to education it puts them at a greater disadvantage they are now left at a, in a situation where at least before covid 19 they could sit in a classroom and receive education but now in the race where the privileged students are moving ahead they are moving ahead because they have all the resources the underprivileged kids are getting left behind and this is what i mean when i say that covid 19 is having a a very negative impact on inequality the gap between the haves and the have nots is simply growing and as policy makers you know perhaps as uh, as educational policy makers as ministers as governments it's extremely important that everybody comes together and sees to it and ensures that 
access to education is equal to everybody it should be accessible to everybody and not just a select few so this disparity this inequity must not grow because of this situation next all right now another thing which makes it um, you know to relate this situation to educational institutions i also want you to remember that a lot of cutting edge research happens at universities you know i teach at a university may and others you know the dean that we have here we are all teaching at universities and we know that cutting edge the next level research happens in universities not just research about social sciences but like may said even research about medical sciences even that is conducted at universities now if universities are not functioning properly if they are not having all the resources if they cannot perhaps become more participative the research outcomes will not come out you know what the universities research on that later on gets reflected in government policies what may would conclude what a professor here would conclude the their research will guide the policy making in their respective countries philippines is going to listen to the dean what his research says indonesia is going to listen to what may's research concludes okay the governments here are also are going to look at what does the research say how can we improve access to education and everything else so it's very important that uh, research outcomes continue to flow from universities the next point here is ensuring the continuity of learning processes you know i'm sure a lot of you may be uh, in the final stages of their education maybe you are about to graduate a lot of people who were looking forward to beginning their careers you know they were really looking forward to write an exam pass through that exam and begin their careers a lot of them will not be able to do that as they planned because of the situation the continuity of their plans has been significantly hampered national economies the labor markets generally depend on the fresh graduates that enter the labor market every year so every year every nation produces a certain number of graduates a certain number of people enter the workforce now in a situation where education's continuity is impacted people are not graduating it is very likely that the labor market will not get what it gets every year because everything is delayed next okay uh, i think i discussed this point the point which is about what puts us at a greater risk you know educational institutions infrastructure some educational institutions have grown just too much you know because of that they might not have the right seating places they might not have enough space and that might really make uh, the spread of virus very easy and we i also told you about how educational institutions can aggravate the risk to greater community maybe a healthy student attending a class may become a carrier and might end up infecting her grandparents she might infect her grandparents and that would be a risk to the larger community she might be fine with it because she has a good immune system but the risk to the larger community cannot be ignored next all right so now let's talk about what may discussed to the accelerated transformation of the role played by educators you know the role of educators is constantly evolving and i want to put this question to all of you did this pandemic make the use of technology essential or was it happening anyways i personally believe that technology was being adopted for education for quite a few years now for the last 5 years or 10 years 
institutions were trying to integrate technology in their education delivery processes this is something that they have been doing for some time now this process becomes accelerated now they cannot go with the slow speed you would notice um i'm not sure uh, the 252 participants that we have here i'm not sure even if half of them would use zoom just 3 months ago 3 months ago a lot of us did not even know that a platform like this exists did not even know about it a lot of us some may have known it but here we see that within a short period of time the popularity has accelerated something has become extremely popular so i believe that uh, technology integration was already happening it was not something which covid 19 brought with it it's not something that covid 19 initiated however we can all see you and i can see we don't have to be experts to notice this we don't have to be experts to notice that now edu educational institutions are adopting technology much much faster today the number of users that zoom has the number of users that microsoft teams would have all of that has simply multiplied this growth of numbers this growth of numbers that has taken place this growth of numbers otherwise would have happened maybe in 2 years or 3 years but that growth has been accelerated why because you know they say need is the mother of invention when there is a need people figure out ways just look at how desperately governments labs pharma companies they are working so hard to find a vaccine to find a cure a lot of work which could have been done maybe it could take 12 years now that much work is happening in months time so that is simply showing us that need is the mother of invention so i personally believe that this pandemic did not create the need for technology but it accelerated the adoption of technology next please okay now there's always a risk that uh, you know traditional teachers teachers and educators who are not very comfortable with technology they kind of feel that will this replace me i mean is technology going to replace teachers it's very important to know that technology is not going to replace great teachers technology will become an enabler it will only make good teachers great okay so i don't know there is a lot of progress happening in ai artificial intelligence machine learning but i still believe that uh, a good teacher so far is not replaceable a good teacher a teacher that can communicate this human touch so far is uh, not replaceable you know all the countries in the world they are um, trying out new different innovative like i said mei innovative they are innovating and they are using technology in different ways we see that a lot of software products that were very expensive earlier they have now become free for example uh, google meets which was a paid application it's a similar classroom okay just like zoom it's going to be very popular maybe in the coming days those products which were very uh, expensive earlier now those products have become free the companies are responding the telecom companies the internet companies they are making internet cheaper in most countries and that is how the world is responding to the covid-19 situation of course technology has a lot of benefits we all know about it i mean it's so obvious i'm sitting here in kuwait addressing a bunch of smart people from philippines from indonesia 
and I'm sure there are people from other countries also. What really made this possible? The only thing is technology that has made this possible. Technology also has some challenges, which is my last point from this slide. Uh, status quo is a big challenge, you know, status quo as they call it. Status quo simply means people's reluctance to change. You know, I think we do it better when people are reluctant to change, when people are resisting change, that is a big challenge for the adoption of technology. Also, as we discussed, places where there is no technology infrastructure, that is also mm, a big challenge for adoption of technology. Next, please. Yes, so I think someone said a beautiful thing here. I think uh, Apollo Nario said something, a great teacher is not replaced by technology. I completely agree with you there. I'm sorry if I am not saying your name correctly. Uh, that's exactly what I have on this slide. Technology will not replace great teachers, but technology in the hands of great teachers will bring about a transformation. Technology when used by smart teachers, not by status coers, you know, not by people who don't want to change, but people who are open to change, people who are embracing a change, such people can really become great teachers with the help of technology. So good teachers can become great teachers if they, with an open mind, adopt and embrace technology. Next, please. So again, another quote, uh, this one says that with the help of technology, teachers will be the leaders in transformation of education around the world. You know, teachers are like, I'm a teacher myself. Teachers are like the frontline soldiers. People sitting in their, you know, high offices, they might make policies. But even if it's a decision about adopting technology, it is the teachers who take the decision and actually implement it in their classrooms. So teachers with the help of technology can become transformational leaders. You know, they can bring about a very major transformation. I want to tell you this, that uh, the world overall is responding very proactively. The use of technology, the use of distance education, online education, whatever you call it, is increasing. But we have to be, and this is my last point here, and I want everyone to please take this point in their hearts. Technology must become an equalizer. It should bring people together at one level. It should not become a differentiator. Technology must not become... Um, a thing which will put the disadvantaged people at a greater disadvantage. It should make them rise and come shoulder to shoulder with everyone else. So if you are an educator, you know, some of you may be, I'm sure some of you are faculty members. A lot of you may be faculty members actually. And you may be having some students who are struggling, not responding. I have students in my online sessions where I do not get responses now I'm asking a question to that student and she is not responding. Maybe a student who's not submitting online. As educators, you and I need to be more human now. We need to become more patient. And we need to remember that it's a new thing. We all would take some time to adopt to it. I tell my students, I tell my colleagues all the time that this is the like, you know, like May used the word the new normal. This is the new normal. And while we are adopting to the new normal, trust me, while we adopt to the new normal, we need to be very patient with each other. You just cannot shut off anyone. Okay, you're not submitting. Okay, you don't get the grades. You really need to be human enough. As an educator, you need to think, maybe she doesn't have access to a personal computer. Maybe she is sharing. Imagine a situation where you have many kids in the house and they don't have that many laptops or they don't have that many tablet PCs. Imagine the dilemma for a parent. If I'm a parent, I've got three kids and I only have one device. What do I do with that? Do I have to choose here? 
as educators, as students, even as students, some of you may be students too, even as students, please remember that your teacher is learning. Your teacher is figuring out things. As students also, you might need to be more patient. You might need to wait a little more for the grades. You know, Don't ask for grades like, where are my grades now? We all are adopting. We all are learning. And we need to help each other through this process. Next. That is all that I had to share with you. Um, I want to thank May. I want to thank uh, the organizers for this fantastic opportunity. I really enjoyed speaking to you guys. I was reading some of the comments. Uh, and I can see that some of you are really participating actively. Thank you very much. And over, over to you, Iko. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Momin, for a very fantastic uh, presentation. And I totally agree with you uh, about the some of the teachers, some of the educators, especially in Indonesia and, uh, and the Philippines, they have uh, some uh, rural area, provincial area. Some of them, the internet connection is very, very slow. And Absolutely. yeah, the teacher cannot be replaced by the technology. I totally agree with you. Thank you, Thank Dr. You. Momin. And we will uh, go to the church speakers, the Professor Louis A. Divinacracia, MAC, DBA. He is a Dean of the College of Business, University of East Caloocan, Philippines. Magandang hapon po. Salamat siyang, Daniel. Yeah, salamat siya. He is an e-learning author in the Asian Productivity Organization, Japan. And he also a former vice-chancellor of the University of the Philippine Open University. Okay. Uh, Prof. Louis, time is yours. Okay. Thank you very much, Daniel and Ibu May, for helping organize this very important event. And uh, I'd like to bring everyone to the presentation materials that we have prepared. And uh, I also want to thank uh, my colleagues from the University of the East, students and faculty members, as well as other academics from other universities in this country and in Indonesia and in Kuwait for joining us. Okay, so let's show the slides to them. Okay, next slide. There are three points that I would like to share to all of you very briefly this afternoon. COVID and higher education, which uh, Ibu May and uh, Dr. Momin has already discussed lengthily this afternoon. Some guidelines of what's happening in our country, the Philippines, and the future, both uh, looking at it from the supply and demand sides. Next slide. So there was a survey conducted very recently by QS. This is a Singapore-based organization that ranks universities globally. And from the slide, you can see that universities whom they surveyed in Asia particularly, the priority activity that they will do is to switch some of their scheduled courses online. This was mentioned by 50% of the respondents. Next slide. Now, what's hap what, what did the students say? Well, the students say, especially those international students studying in this country, say that they express some interest studying online. But here's their challenge, Inter internet bandwidth. And for some of the teachers and academics and educators, it is a challenge of moving from face-to-face -face or lecture-listen model to a purely interactive, learn-by-doing model. By the way, let us define clearly what online learning before we move forward. Online le learning actually takes place over the internet. It is internet-based, and it can be face-to-face -face via the internet or self-study on your own. Okay, next slide. So we're looking at the internet bandwidth comparison. This is a 2017 study. And we can see here, if Indonesia ranked 77 during that time, 
countries like the Philippines rank number 100. And if the bandwidth, minimum bandwidth is about 55, the Philippines is just on the boundary versus Indonesia's 72 Mbps. Now, you'd like to benchmark yourself with the top three. You can see that their bandwidths are at least five, six times better than the bandwidth. Okay, next slide. Now, for our audience in Indonesia as well as in Kuwait, the cost of internet connection in the Philippines is roughly 30 US dollars a month. Uh, this is provided by our uh, phone company called the PLDT. A rival company, next slide, called Globe, the offer, Globe recently made an offer to, uh, to students and teachers their offer was about $25 per month to get 30 days continuous access to prepaid internet. Now, what is the implication of that as far as affordability is concerned? And given the bandwidth that we're experiencing right now. Next slide. So you can see here the economic profile of the country as of 2015. I adjusted this to the 2020 data set and you can see here that about five years ago, relatively the poorer sectors of our society, lower middle to the poor, hardly makes money. And that's why we see a lot of students, maybe their children, as scholars. But again, let's compare their monthly household income to what PLDT or Globe charges to us for an internet connection. Next slide. So roughly 70% or 80% are below middle income class. And so how is the government or universities, both private and public, addressing this very huge segment where a majority of the students, both college, secondary education are coming from? Next slide. So the poor will have to spend about 20%, 19% of their monthly household income to get an internet connection for one month. If they connect to Globe, that's 14%. Now, if you move down the line, a middle income class household will be paying about 2% of their income, monthly household income. So if we're talking about equity here, then PLDT and Globe, should be able to reduce the rates they're offering to the lower middle income or low income class by at least a half so that the proportion budget wise that families will have to pay for internet will be the same as the money being paid by middle class income households. Okay, next slide. So what is our government given to higher education institutions, universities and colleges, both public and private here in the Philippines? Next slide. This is, I think, one of the latest guidelines issued. We have a department called, uh, or a commission called higher education, which is separate from the uh, Department of Education. And this takes care of all higher education programs, you would note again that they did not advocate online learning. What they advocated is flexible learning and other alternative modes of delivery. And, uh, and they've given a leeway to the administrators of the different universities on how best to meet the contact hour requirements of the programs they're offering so that students will be able to complete their subjects or degrees on time. Next slide. And so if you're looking at the Philippines, it's about over a thousand hundred, a thousand islands. Indonesia has double number of islands, but it moves from north to south. We only have one time zone. The focus of the outbreak based on our colleagues from the University of the Philippines is actually on the dark blue section of the island. And that is Metro Manila, parts of northern, north of Metro Manila, and parts of south Metro Manila. 
and this is the area of concentration. This is the area where a lot of, of students are being affected as well as universities. The other areas in the country is relatively white or clear, meaning the data shows that they have not been infected as much compared to this. Okay, next slide. So how do the uh, government, particularly our commission on higher education, define flexible learning? One, it's learner-centered. And second, it must be able to provide choices. Meaning, teachers can still use other means. During my time when I was a, a college student, we, we used a tape recorder because there was no internet yet during that time. Or we use this thing called correspondence education where teachers would send by physical mail to students the course materials because we didn't have internet. But today we have internet so we can revive the use of other forms that do not uh, use the internet like CDs for example. Or we can download the materials very quickly from the internet so that we can study on our own and then go back to the internet later on. The other aspect here is the availability of learning resources. Now the Philippines fortunately is blessed by a variety of open access to open learning resources. And I'll show this to you in the next slides. So these are the open learning resources and people from all over the world can access this. You've heard about the UNESCO materials. The Southeast Asia Minister of Education Organization, or SIMEO, is offering a massive open online courses for free, and this can be accessed through their website. We have the OER Commons, and teachers can use this to download free learning materials, and they can collaborate with each other. Uh, my former university, the University of the Philippines Open University, also has a commons, and it contains a repository of learning materials developed by the university. The University of the Philippines also has a internet TV called TVUP and others. So again, these OERs are supposed to be used for teaching, learning, research. They are available in the public domain. Their IP licenses uh, agree that they can be used for free by students and teachers alike. Next slide. So how are we operationalizing flexible learning in the Philippines? Well, our technical panel, one of the technical panels in the Commission of Higher Education coined this term, Technology Mediated Flexible Teaching and Learning or TMFTL. Currently, the technical panel is already conducting a survey among different schools in the country to determine their preparedness or the advances that they have as far as TMFTL is concerned. So again, it has been defined as the utilization of technology in the, under a normal situation, residential or traditional or face-to-face, -face, and others like blended flipped classroom and so forth and so on. You can use asynchronous, study on your own, or synchronous as what we are doing right now in this teleconference. Next slide. So an example, therefore, of a shift to the approach. On the left side, you see the traditional, where the home activity is creating, evaluating, or analyzing data sets or assignments. You now have a shift of that. So the homework activity in a face-to-face -face setting is now being transported into a classroom culture or an online classroom uh, lecture type. And the traditional face-to-face -face classroom lecture will now become part of the so-called asynchronous or uh, study on your own type. And so this shift from traditional to an example like FLIF is not easy for teachers to do, especially those who are not familiar with this. And so again, training is needed. And so again, the universities are hard pressed to train their teachers. But since to our friends in Indonesia and Kuwait, we have been isolated in our homes for almost two months now. And uh, hopefully we can begin traveling after 
May 15. But again, the challenge is the government said that schools might remain closed and teachers are classified as a profession under level four. So which means that we may not be uh, the priority in terms of getting back to work. But anyway, while at home or wherever we are right now in our dormitories, we have to learn how this is being done. And that is what I've been doing by myself. I am teaching myself on how to shift from a face-to-face -face mode to an online mode. Okay, next slide. So the face-to-face -face is on the lower left-hand corner. And so the movement is towards the upper right-hand corner. And as you move up, you will see that universities and students and learners will have to learn on their own or if they want to be connected, schools, universities, and colleges will have to invest in technology. And so this, again, would require internet connection, IT in investments in IT infrastructure, training for both teachers and students, and so forth and so on. Okay, next slide. So moving from the lower left hand to the upper right hand column offers certain advantages, maybe as we live to survive this so-called educational disruption, we might see maybe the growth in inquiry-based learning, maybe game-based learning, where some of our colleagues from the College of Engineering, Faculty of Engineering, or Computer Studies are doing right now, or the Faculty of Sciences. Next slide. And the thrust towards online learning or flexible learning did not start this year. When we examined our development plan, and that was about 16 years ago, the government has already emphasized at that time the urgency of introducing and expanding flexible and diverse learning options. And that was 16 years ago. And then six years ago, we had a law called the Open Distance Learning Act. And the law requires the University of the Philippines, among other educational institutions, to assist other schools and colleges, including high schools, for get, to get their teachers trained on blended learning. And our current development plan aims to provide even beyond that, even beyond flexible learning to lifelong learning. Okay, next slide. So we're fortunate that Michigan Virtual from the uh, University of Michigan has shared with us this criteria to find out the preparedness of teachers and academics to pursue online and flexible learning. You can go to the website of Michigan Virtual and you can download this. This is an open resource. And you can use this to test your preparedness to go online or your, the preparedness of your faculties, or your universities or your college. Next slide. And so what is our future? Now, as an economist, I'll just be putting one graph here so that uh, I can illustrate this further. Okay, next slide. So as far as our friends from the United States are concerned, the faculty members said that through the years, the percentage number of teachers teaching online is gradually increasing. But that is the North American story. We have to find out how much from Indonesia, the Philippines, or Kuwait is ready to teach flexible learning or online. And so that's why these surveys are going on at this moment. Okay, next slide. And so these are the four phases by which a college, a person, a teacher, a university goes through. And so, and this takes time. So in other words, for those who are still in its infancy stage, then they are on the left, left part of the square alignment and they have to move forward. So, in, our, in the situation of the University of the East, we are blessed that we have a Canvas, an online learning facility. De La Salle University is also blessed because they've been doing online for, I think, the past 10 years. 
UP has been doing that as well. So maybe they are in the post-pilot phase. But again, they're struggling. Their students are complaining that, again, access to the internet uh, is a constraint. And some teachers say also the same. Okay, that's the supply side. Next slide. And so this is, again, a rubric that comes from Michigan Virtual. And administrators can use this to find out how ready their school is for online and flexible learning. And I've heard, although this is not yet official, that the Commission on Higher Education might provide funds, especially for colleges or schools that may need help so that they can improve their readiness. Again, for the information of our friends, Daniel said to me last week that the government of Indonesia has cut the budget uh, going to higher education but by, by more than a big percentage. In the Philippines, the budget cut was already 30% for government universities. And, uh, and we don't know how the mix of funding uh, can be reprogrammed so that schools would need help to be able to implement flexible learning. And so funds are needed. And so again, a challenge for the future. Okay, next slide. So this is typical break-even analysis. Looks complicated to some, but again, the vertical side there is the price that colleges or universities are charging students. Theoretically, online or flexible learning is supposed to lower down the price from P1 to P2. But the challenge of universities is they will be making investments in infrastructure, training of faculty, and producing online materials and so which means therefore that if you re reduce the p1 to p2 and our average variable cost plus the atc the average total cost will remain high universities or colleges will lose money especially if they're privately operated and if the government operated then that means more subsidies to be given to them and so what we're simply saying is we would like to avoid the shutdown point so in other words, there must be a solution by which the prices will not go up beyond P1, but hopefully prices will be, remain stable or even go down. And at the same time, maybe subsidies from government or from donors can help alleviate the plight of schools so that their average total cost will not go up as they invest in flexible learning. Okay, next slide. So again, about 25,000 young people from across the world were surveyed about four years ago. And based on that survey, a great majority said that they have taken an online course. That's the green one. I don't know the situation in the Philippines. We might we have to find that out again. Next slide. And when they were asked, what kind of additional education will you be willing to pursue after you finish college or start your career? I thought it were students prefer the graduate programs, but interestingly, they would want certification programs that can complement whatever they finish in college or whatever they finish in grad school. Now, this is an area of opportunity also for colleges and universities to look at the needs of their alumni and maybe help improve their chances of remaining viable given this educational disruption stage. Okay, next slide. So one innovative way is a ladderized program. I'm just using the MBA as an example. There are other graduate programs can also do the same. But what I'm saying here is that graduate programs can be taken in bite sizes and side by side with certification programs. So certification programs can be credited as part of the degrees or offer dual degree options. And if open online education appears to be lower than face-to-face, -face, then students might be motivated to be taking this type of ladderized programs through certification. But again, we're waiting for CHED to say okay to this so-called flexible hybrid flexible pathway approach. 
I have a second example. This one pertains to a current initiative. Next slide. This is a current initiative that we're, click some more so that we can see that particular slide. Please click it. Okay. So we're, 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 we're testing it out at uh, the University of the East where we're trying to combine a entrepreneurship incubator diploma program for our students, which they can take side by side with their degree programs. And this is offered online. And if our, our board of trustees eventually will say that this is okay, that our students can both get a college degree with a professional certification and hopefully have some dual degree options with other colleges or universities, then this is good. So we are still in the uh, development phase as far as this is concerned. We just had a video conference with the Academy of Entrepreneurs of Australia, which has expressed interest to tie up with our universities, in very particular university in terms of this hybrid flexible pathway. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I hope that these two examples, plus the other challenges that I've mentioned, to everyone will be a good eye opener and this will help us move forward. And I'm still optimistic that despite this lockdown that we're experiencing in our countries, particularly in Metro Manila and provinces north and south of that, we'll be able to, uh, to survive, if not to grow, by using these education technologies. Thanks you, thank you once again to Ibu May, to Unitomo and to my colleagues here in the Philippines for, uh, for listening. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dean Divina Gracia, uh, for a very unique presentation. And uh, you mentioned that my story about the cutting budget. I think in every country you now, even in US, they're cutting the education budget. Because they're thinking that, oh, the, the teacher just is sleeping when they are teaching. <laughs> okay, uh, we will open the say, uh, q a session. You can uh, type your uh, question to all the speakers in the uh, chat room. You can type the, your name, uh, your institution, and also your question. And... Uh, I will ask him first question for all the speakers. What are you, uh, how you combine your uh, lecture, because all of you are lecturers uh, during this COVID-19, your experience uh, from the Dr. May. Dr. May, you still here? Okay. Can you hear? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. Okay. So? Yeah. What's your experience? Equation? Yeah, yeah. What's your experience during the COVID-19? Your, uh, how you are doing your uh, classes, how you combine, how you hybrid, your uh, experience stories. I'm just staying at home and I'm doing all my work uh, by online. All my work. Uh, so Classes and also thesis, also conference and um, yeah, many talk show by webinar meeting, television, radio, also in uh, online. And the how the response of the students, Doc me. The students. I response. think it's a, it's a new, new, new fact and unique because uh, my students more active in discussion. They are brave to speak. So I think uh, it will be. Uh, good for speaking 
good skill for them. Okay. Okay. How about I you? I don't know. I don't know what's the difference between in class and online. Maybe because in class we are face to face, so uh, the student have uh, fear to the teacher to me, and online just from screen, so they're more brave. Mm. They were, I think, when uh, my online class. So okay, and yeah. how about you, Doctor Momin? Uh, your experience how to hybrid the classes and uh, what's your activity during the COVID and how's the quite uh, facing the COVID-19? There's one thing which is common uh, among teachers, among educators, among students and that is anxiety. The situation is uh, uh, very fluid. We don't know what's happening. Uh, of course, you know, this anxiety I know is shared by the whole world. So that is one feeling which is common. And that's not specific to education, I think. People are anxious in general, number one. Number two, as far as learning is concerned, I am pleasantly surprised about how easy it is to integrate technology. Um, then I thought, uh, of course, like in May's university, uh, universities here also have a significant integration of technology already there is a learning management system there is a online uh, announcement system everything is in place but the later on the additions that were made i was a little apprehensive i was a little unsure about whether we would need more time to adopt to it but i'm completely surprised to see that the students as well as the educators have really transitioned very well they did not take much time and uh, like may said when we are face to face it's a different experience um, but i have a unique uh, observation i would say a lot of students perhaps who may not just students in uh, a regular class or even a in even a session like this a lot of people who may be in real life introvert they might not open up much but in an online session, when uh, they are not being judged, they don't have the fear of being judged, they open up more easily. So my observation is that uh, online uh, platforms are also very empowering. A lot of students or a lot of participants who are reluctant, they also feel empowered and they feel uh, more confident to come up and express themselves better than they would have done in a conventional classroom, in a conventional setup, I think learners are apprehensive of being judged. You know, people are looking at me, they might laugh at me. I don't want to, I don't know how to say it, but these fears are reduced uh, when they have, uh, when they feel more secure online. That is what my experience has been. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Momin. And how about you, Dr. Divna Gracia? Uh, how the Philippines facing the COVID? and how you blended the learning, your classes, and maybe your uh, managerial uh, activity as the dean, <laughs> how do you manage that? Yeah, well, uh, the very important thing that I learned during this particular situation is to continue encouraging our teachers to teach despite their limitations, and also to encourage the students to continue learning because there are certain challenges that teachers face. Some of them cannot even calculate the final grades of their students because some of the materials are left in the offices and we mm -hmm. cannot enter the university. And the deadline for final grade submission is uh, coming soon. Some students who are on their thesis uh, preparation or presentation need to uh, present face to face. So we've got to be innovative, creative on how we can do that online or do, do it using the uh, referee approach where these materials are reviewed by a panel and then later on communicated to the students. Mm. Third is, of course, the threat that this will never end. And so what we're saying is if ever we will still remain at home, then uh, do we have 
much choice uh, but to adapt to this uh, new normal. That means we have to do for summer classes that will start uh, in, in June here in Manila for some universities and colleges. We have no choice but to offer this online. And so we have to encourage teachers to embark on this so-called training. And so teachers have to spend more hours of their time at home to learn or relearn this online or flexible learning tools and techniques. So those are the challenges that administrators like me face. But again, the bottom line is we have to continue encouraging one another and giving confidence to each other that we will be able to uh, survive this, this disruption and succeed thereafter. Okay. Okay, thank you, Dean Defina Gracia. And I already compiled uh, some questions from the audience. First is from the Roy Bassa from Arizona, United States of America. And uh, this is a question for all the speakers. How will online classes affect science experiments requiring the use of instruments like uh, using the microscopes? How can we provide remedy on this situation? Uh, maybe we can start from the Dr. Momin first. That's a very good question. I think that's a great question. Um, science education and science related activities are very severely impacted in a situation like this. I think we also need to remember that activities in the lab, they are not number intensive. That means they, they do not require places to be crowded. So we can see that in the future, in the near future, we can have science labs open up because in places where there is no risk of crowding, where there is less risk of transmission, where there can be good protocols that can be applied. In such places, I think we can make exceptions and we should make exceptions so that scientific activities go on. So I would like to see that there is a differentiation made between regular classroom learning and lab activities. And as far as lab activities are concerned, let us prioritize them because that is something which will not be uh, very effectively done using the uh, electronic media. That is what uh, I would say about this. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Momin. And, Thanks for your question. And, uh, yeah. And uh, what's your uh, opinion, Dean Divina Gracia, about the question from the Roy? Yeah, that's a valid question. Our university for the past two weeks has been uh, doing a canvas of suppliers of virtual laboratories for our sciences, biology, chemistry. We have a faculty of dentistry, also uh, non-biological subjects used in engineering. And uh, at some point, uh, I asked my younger son, uh, who is a microbiologist, and I asked him, when he was studying in North America, I asked him, have you heard about virtual labs? And he said, yes, we've been using it. And, uh, and I said, are there generous suppliers of virtual labs? And he <laughs> showed me a list of some of, Donated. a list of where we can get some of this so-called, uh, uh, some freeware to operate the virtual labs. Now, I also ask uh, our friends in the accounting profession, do we have an accounting virtual lab? And they said, yes, there is. So, but we're still in the process of uh, completing this, this canvas to see where we can invest money to help set this up. Now, the other thing for the laboratories is uh, the use of, uh, some of you might be surprised that you can use texting. Uh, to be able to uh, share results of experiments or studies with each other, especially when internet connection is low. Again, the key is how much is texting? Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, so that, again, that, that boils down again to how much our telecom providers can lower down uh, the cost of uh, communicating uh, mm -hmm. at, this, at this time. Thank you. No, thank you, Dean Louis. And uh, how about you, the dog me about the question from the Roy about the 
microscope, uh, microscope and uh, maybe the laboratory activities during this COVID-19. Sorry, uh, Doc May, your voice. Okay. Okay. I explained uh, as I explained earlier that everything can be online unless it is related to human life. But in some faculties, I think uh, they still have to combine between online and offline, uh, especially uh, technology faculty, and we call it. Omni learning combined between online education and offline education. We can uh, uh, do theory in online and laboratory in offline. I think uh, that's omni omni education learning is good to implement it. Okay. Okay, thank you, Dr. Me, for the question, uh, the answer. And uh, we will uh, pass to the next question from the Joy Sagosoy from the Binan Secondary School of Applied Academics from the Department Education Binan in Laguna in the Dindifina Gracia home. Uh, the question is... Uh, with the immediate demand on the online distance learning, how do you think the government and education sectors can break the disparity when it comes to the necessary technology, especially for the learner from the rural area without sacrificing the health and safety of the teachers and the students as well as the quality of education? And also, how are we going to strengthen the teachers and the parent uh, partnerships? Okay, we starting from the Dean Gracia from Laguna. Well, actually, that's uh, there are various places that you may call rural, but they are easily connected with the urban centers. Mm. I think the the more challenges are when you say rural are those in the hills or in the mountain areas where you have to cross rivers or even you know cross mountains to be able to reach that point. And so during that time when I was a young teacher and we were supposed to reach these far flung areas, we had to do it by ourselves. We have to be there because there's no way of reaching those communities uh, unless by being present over there. Now, I don't know to how much extent our local government units have been provided the resources to be able to help uh, set up these so-called common learning facilities that can be extended to the villages. I'm not sure about that status, but in the past, I know that there has been experiments on how to implement remote learning through our local governments to be able to reach the farthest areas in the country. Maybe it's time that we can ask our, you know, our, our people who has been doing research on this so-called remote learning in the villages, get the best practices. If we don't have one yet, and we can ask UNESCO and how it's done in other countries and maybe learn from them so that we can provide the solutions for this. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dean Tiffana Gracia. And uh, how about your opinion, uh, Dr. May, about the situation? For the question from the Laguna. Laguna is uh, close Laguna to Metro. Laguna is a place. Yeah, yeah, it's close to Metro Manila. It's like in Jakarta, it's in Depo. Uh, it's equal with Depo or Bogor. <laughs> in Surabaya also, there is a Laguna. Uh, yeah, it's my Near home. with your house. <laughs> <laughs> government is accelerating online learning. No, yeah. How the government? Uh, I will repeat the question. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how the government? Uh, uh, with the immediate de demand of the online distance learning, how do you think the government edu and education sector can break the disparity when it comes to the necessary technology learner? from the rural area without sacrificing the health and safety for the teachers and the students as well as the quality of the education. Okay, 
uh, in online performance, in online performance, I think we can uh, I think we can see from our student how they accept the theory, the theory of the teacher, uh, their discipline, their also uh, uh, in discussion, how deep the theory they know. So I think um, from online, we can also, we can also uh, know how is the participate of the student, the activity. Uh, so we can count the activity to the score except except uh, other of uh, mid test or test something like that then okay okay thank you dr man uh, what is your answer that dr muchaba momin dr muchaba momin you still here yeah it's you I think uh, it is a challenge. It is a challenge for places where uh, there is uh, less access to telephone or internet technology. But I think there's one change with which we should notice. You're noticing that the applications, the platforms which are being created for education delivery, including the platform Zoom, these apps are being made extremely light. You know, even the developers are working very hard to keep these resources light so that they can be used by people at a large scale. These apps are not very bulky or they do not consume a lot of internet resources or data bandwidth, which is what allows more people to use it more conveniently. However, we have to make very localized decisions about this for places that may not be uh, suitable for e-learning, we cannot, uh, you know, implement it forcibly. We cannot enforce this on them like a blanket thing. We need to differentiate. I know about uh, institutions which are having a wide area to cover. For some parts of the region, they might differentiate their tests. You know, some of some parts may have online education. Some of them may have paper and pen tests like Professor Louis mentioned, that could be sent through people, you know, an exam to be written and sent to the headquarters maybe. So we need to make localized decisions based on every uh, locality, based on every environment. But it's important to notice that we recognize that most of the platforms are waking up to the reality. They know that they have to be light. They know that they have to be user friendly and which and this fact is a big relief. You can see that an app like Zoom can function on even an old Android version, so which is amazing. Why are they doing that? Because they want people who are using all types of devices to use this technology. So technology has to come one step further. Educational institutions have to differentiate based on local needs. And in this way, we would be able to meet the wider requirements of regions. That's what I think. Okay, thank you, Dr. Womin. And uh, yeah. another interesting question from the Lawrence Stew for all the panels is uh, about the how about the course to involve the physical context like uh, culinary arts, the hospitality management, how it affects the quality of the knowledge if a student engages in the online class. Can the, and it's a very special for the Philippines. Can the Philippines afford to the provide a faster internet connection with a cheap rate? I think not only Philippines, in Indonesia, in Singapore, in Japan also, they're asking for the cheap internet connection. Okay. Uh, <laughs> how about your opinion, uh, Dr. Me, about uh, this uh, question? Uh... I think, as we know, that we can find many tutorials in YouTube. Mm. Uh, so I think uh, for hospitality management, also culinary, uh, we can find, we can give it, deliver it uh, by online. Uh, 
uh, like example so many cooking class uh, on YouTube it's the it, it is described that uh, culinary can we can deliver uh, practice of culinary by online the teacher can upload their tutorial to the YouTube and the student can watch it, uh, watch on the YouTube. Okay. Yeah, I think uh, How about that's the, uh, okay the for cheap online. internet in Indonesia. Is that possible maybe? The, yeah. The cheap and affordable internet. Maybe contact uh, the telecom cell. <laughs> Yeah, maybe in some place in Indonesia, uh, rather difficult for the internet. But uh, most of uh, place in Indonesia, the internet uh, is good. Yeah, and uh, now it's a cheap the Wi-Fi in everywhere, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cheap and, for uh, some people, I think. <laughs> <laughs> and how about in quiet, Doctor uh, Momins? Uh, what's your opinions about the culinary arts and the hospitality management? That's a really needs a practice internships because uh, maybe now the hotel are closed, the restaurant are closed, no interns for the students. <laughs> okay, so this is what I think. Um, things which involve uh, practice like culinary arts or hospitality training, I'm not sure if we can really include them as very essential learning as such. I believe that these are more artistic pursuits. You know, and uh, I'm not saying that they're less important, but the point is um, in situations where access to technology is difficult, we really don't have to aggressively push for it. These things are perhaps more on the leisurely and more in the luxury segment. So we really don't have to panic about these because we always have an opportunity to focus more on more significant things which are needed at the moment. That's what I think. Okay. Okay. And how about the internet connection in quiet, Dr. Momin? Is that I believe that uh, Kuwait has one of the best internet connectivity uh, rankings. You know, we have got 5G here. Mm. Um, wow. There are several companies which make it really inexpensive. It is cheap too. So I don't think uh, connectivity is an issue in the GCC region, in uh, most of the Arab nations. Also. Uh, since now the internet is an essential uh, need for the human, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Momin. And how about you, okay. Dr. Divina Gracia? Because uh, many hotels now close, shut down. <laughs> and I know in the Philippines, uh, uh, many hotels now, uh, hotel chain is uh, closed now. Yes, some of our hotel chains are used as uh, areas where people have to be brought for quarantine. Quarantine, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I was trying to reflect on this particular issue even much before this webinar has been scheduled. I remember the time that when we, wanted, when we were trained, we wanted to be trained using a skill without the internet. Yes. There were two mediums that we were used, or two media. One is the radio, which reaches even fairly far distant places. We have a school on the air. And uh, once upon a time, my wife was involved teaching using the radio uh, to far-flung areas. And this is the second is the television. Of course, Ibu may mention about the YouTube, and this is uh, via the internet. So how do you apply that to hospitality, especially that this concerns about food preparation? The challenge here is assessment because teachers cannot go to these areas to physically check how the students are doing it, yes. assuming they can do a manual, then this calls for some, they have to deputize, for instance, uh, members from the hotel and restaurant association of a particular province or area, deputize them because they are closely in the area where the students reside and then give them the rubric and if they have internet facility, take a video, upload it, and then send it to the teacher. Or have a, again, a website where this can be uploaded. Of course, this is an idea at the moment, but it is an important aspect to be addressed because even if that's hospitality, that still pertains about food. And uh, even food technology will be affected. Even agriculture will be affected. So there must be ways of, 
of enabling learners to be assessed even if internet is not possible, even if teachers cannot go there to assess, even if they cannot go to school physically. Okay, that's my, my quick answer to that. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Divina Gracia, about the answering the how the hospitality management can be still struggling in this uh, pandemic. And uh, I want to inform you about the certificate. We will uh, distribute the certificate by the using uh, online. And uh, because of the limited time, I uh, just to uh, say sorry and do apologize for the not all question will be uh, delivered to all the speakers. And uh, thank you very much, the Dean Divina Gracia, Dr. May, and Dr. Momin for very wonderful uh, sharing. I hope the COVID-19 will be uh, end soon. Yeah, I'm. Last time I I visiting Philippines only less than the forty eight hours. Didn't even know about it before the community quarantine, and it's like a, I can write book the how to struggle in Manila before forty eight hours. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much for all uh, participations and. Uh, before I close the decision, I also asking the happy birthday to the Dr. May. Because the Dr. May now is a birthday now. I don't know how, because it, asking the age to the woman are taboo. Huh? <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, <laughs> And uh, you mute the over. Peter, can you mute over? Okay, thank you very much for your Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you for a very inspiring session. And uh, I hope. All of you stay safe during this uh, COVID-19 and see you in the next webinar. If you are interesting, uh, today, uh, May 8th, we have a business seminar in this channel also. But uh, the seminar contact in Bahasa Indonesia. Okay, have a good day and stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you, Daniel. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Much love. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you so much. Thanks for the opportunity. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.